liked the early music ensemble Passamezzo. In normal times, we'd be playing concerts and rehearsing new projects together, but like so many other musicians, we haven't been able to do that. So I've spent lockdown writing a book about the music that was played and sung during the plagues that took place in Tudor and Stuart, England. The subject matter is a bit grim, but it's been a great distraction. Various forms of plague raged through the country in waves throughout this period. In early Tudor times, the greatest danger came from the Sudor Anglicus, better known as the Sweating Sickness, while the bubonic plague, which had first ravaged the country in the 14th century, returned with deadly force, with some of its worst outbreaks occurring during the Elizabethan and Stuart eras. Many details of the plague are already well known to us, through the accounts of writers like Samuel Pepys and Daniel Defoe. But another great resource can be found in the words of broadside ballads. These ballads are mostly anonymous, written in doggerel verse and set to popular tunes. Few, if any of them, can be said to be great literature, but they do give us insight into the daily life and attitudes of the time. Written for a wide and frequently illiterate audience, they might be sung on street corners or at fairs and markets or sold for pennies and taken home. There are records of a great number of broadside ballads being printed on the subject of the plague. Sadly, few of these have survived over the centuries, but those that we do have give us grisly details of plagues, be they biblical, historical or contemporary. Some also contain calls for repentance or cries for mercy, records of deaths and suggestions for remedies. Unusually for broadside ballads, very few have melody indications given, although almost all are in the same metre. Where a tune for the ballads in this metre is mentioned, it is a not too high. This was another name for Fortune My Foe, an anonymous 16th century melody, which unsurprisingly, given its title, was always associated with calamities, evil deeds and retribution. Anyone hearing a song sung to this tune would know that the story was not going to end well. Reader, whatever thou art, rich or poor, rouse up thyself, for death stands at the not as advanced as it is today, the idea of contagion was understood, and then, as now, it was recognised that the cities had the highest rates of infection. The authorities instituted social distancing measures to try and mitigate this, with punishments for those who broke the rules. Places of entertainment were closed and public events and gatherings were cancelled. Orders conceived and published by the Lord Mayor and Alderman of the City of London concerning the infection of the plague. That all plays, bear baitings, games, singing of ballads, buckler play or such like causes of assemblies of people be utterly prohibited 
and the party's offending severely punished by every alderman in his ward. I found it strange to see that the singing of ballads was among the prohibited activities. Then I realised that this was due to the fact that ballad singers would sing on street corners or at markets or at fairs. They'd gather a crowd. They also moved about the city and the country. These were all means of spreading infection. The orders also decreed that all public feasting, and particularly by the companies of this city, and dinners at taverns, alehouses and other places of common entertainment be forborne until further order and allowance, and that the money thereby saved be preserved and employed for the benefit and relief of the poor visited with the infection. That every house visited be marked with a red cross of a foot long in the middle of the door and with the usual printed words, Lord have mercy upon us. If a house was infected, its inhabitants would be shut inside often for as much as a month or 40 days and a red cross painted on the outside to warn others not to go near. People died in their thousands, and the plague was almost universally seen as a judgment from God. The words, Lord have mercy upon us, were to be found everywhere. <laughs> time show some striking parallels with today's situation. Then, as now, fear of infection meant that you could neither visit nor comfort sick friends and family, nor even attend their funeral. Once busy streets were now silent and deserted, and people isolated within their homes began to lose track of time. Most of the ballads also talk about how one of the only sounds to be heard was that of bells tolling for the dead. A sickness comfortless, when we do fear to see those friends whom we do love most dear. The death as comfortless, where not appears one friend to shed some tender funeral tears. Through the naked towns of death there was such plenty, one bell at once was fain to ring for twenty. No clocks were heard to strike upon their bells, cause nothing rung but death lamenting knells. that the hours should fail to tell the day, when time to thousands ran so fast away. Time was confused, and kept at such a plight, the day to thousands now was made a night.
death all conditions equally invades. Nor riches, power, nor beauty here persuades. Old die with young, with women men. The rage of the dire plague spares neither sex nor age. Those last few lines describe how death stalks all around and how nobody, whatever their station in life, can escape the plague. The figure in the centre has plague sores upon him. He is named as sickness, death's minstrel. The image itself is a ballad printed during the plague year of 1569. This theme of the danse macabre, or dance of death, was to be seen in paintings on the walls of churches before the Reformation, also in woodcuts and engravings and printed books, with death himself often depicted as a skeleton and a musician. It was also a very popular subject for ballads. While a few of these ballads actually mention the plague, as far as I can tell, they were all first printed during plague years. Thomas Hill's Doleful Dance and Song of Death, entitled The Shaking of the Sheeps, is another ballad that was first recorded in the year 1569. It begins with the words, Can you dance the shaking of the sheeps, the dance that everyone must do? And there are two dance tunes, both called The Shaking of the Sheeps. The ballad can be sung to either of them. The first one you've heard appears in Playford's Dancing Master from 1651 onwards, while the second one is found in a number of sources, including William Ballett's lute book. It has to be said that both tunes are rather more cheerful than you would expect them to be, given their subject matter. ballad on this theme is Death's Dance. Printed first in 1625, it's a wonderful social commentary describing the behaviour of gossiping wives, drunkards in tippling houses, dancing gallants, grasping landlords, merchants and many other characters, while remarking how very differently they would act if they could only see death coming amongst them. The melody used for Death's Dance had a number of names, including Oh No, 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 Not Yet, and Walking in a Country Town. But after being used in this ballad, it became known as Death's Dance. <laughs> Dance of Death can be found in Thomas Nash's play, Summer's Last Will and Testament, which is thought first to have been performed in the autumn of 1592, during one of the worst outbreaks of plague of Queen Elizabeth's reign. The song Adieu Farewell, Earth's Bliss, is often known as a litany in time of plague. No specific music survives for it. But when we performed the play at Shakespeare's Globe with the lion's part in 2000, I set the song to the music of a consort song by Robert Parsons. 
Before the song, Summer, who is on the point of death, calls for music, saying, Sing me some doleful ditty to the blues that make plain my near approaching death. Uncertain is fond our life's last for lustful joys. Death proves them all but toys. None from his darts can fly. I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Rich men trust not in wealth. Gold cannot buy you hell. Physic himself must fade, must fade. All the things to end are made. The plague for swift goes by. I am sick. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. Haste there for each degree to welcome destiny. Heaven is our heaven. Heritage, heritage. Earth but a play, a stage. Mount we unto the sky. I am sick, I must die. Lord, have mercy. of Lord have mercy upon us, there were many prayers against the plague, and the churches themselves stayed open, unlike today. In pre-Reformation England, the Marian hymn, Stella Chaley Ex Dear Parvit, was among the most popular. It's a song to the Virgin, imploring her in her mercy to intercede and to add her prayers to help end the plague. Never part of any official liturgy, it doesn't have a standardised plain song melody, but survives in different versions in a number of manuscripts. Stella celi extirpavit, quella acta vit dominum. Mortis pestem quam planta vit, primus parens ominum. Ipsa stella nunc dinietus sidera compescere. Quorum bella plebem cedunt direm mortis ulcere. O pissima stella Maria, a pere. 
este sucure nobis. Audi nos domina nam te firius, nihil negans honorat. Salva nos, Jesu. Procuibus virgo matete orat. The stellar celli can also be found in polyphonic form, and this image shows the tenor part of a setting from the court of Henry VIII. One of the latest occurrences of the Stella Celli in England is a three-part work said to have been composed by John Thorne during the reign of Mary Tudor as a thanksgiving for the deliverance of the city of York from the plague. After the Reformation, different songs were needed. This is Orlando Gibbons's setting of George Wither's hymn for deliverance from a public sickness. like those of the psalms were also used and one of the most quoted psalms both in sermon and in song was psalm 91. Unlike most of the songs which focus on God's wrath this psalm is full of words of comfort. Here are some of the relevant words from Thomas East's Psalter of 1592 where it is set to be sung in four parts by Edmund Hooper. He shall defend thee from the snare the which the hunter laid, and from the deadly plague and care whereof thou art afraid, so that thou shalt not need, I say, to fear or be aflight of all the shafts that fly by day, nor terrors of the night, nor of the plague that privily doth walk in dark so fast. Thou shalt not need none ill to fear, with thee it shall not mell, nor yet the plague shall once come near the house where thou dost dwell. 
Even in these grim times, songwriters manage to find some humour. Here is a four-part round, sung to the tune of the Crab of the Wood. It mocks the priests who left London during the plague of 1665, only to return and have their churches burned down during the Great Fire of the following year. When the plague was in town, the ministers went when down. The and plague was in town, the ministers went down. But when the fire came, the churches did the same. The plague was the king, the churches did the same. But when the fire came, the churches did the same. The plague was the king, the churches did the same. The plague was the king, the churches did the same. The plague was the king, the churches. The churches did the same, that west of the king, the churches did the same, that most of the priests were churches did the same, that most of the priests were dumb. This next image has nothing to do with music, but I like it and I think it's relevant to us now. It's a poem from Henry Petto's The Country Ague, which was printed in 1625 and it offers some advice on social distancing. It's an acrostic, and if you read it downwards, you can see that it says, stand further off. Here is another acrostic, yet another ballad that can be sung to the tune of Fortune My Foe. The words are by Martin Parker, and it was printed during the plague of 1636. If you read it downwards, you will see a repeated cry of Lord have mercy upon us. <laughs> now, but on a less miserable note. Here is Orlando Gibbons's hymn in time of public sickness with updated words. <laughs> Just one. 